Good evening. I'd like to welcome all of you who've joined us for this special public event of the Nonfiction Now conference, an evening with Helen Garner. My name is David Carlin, and I'm the co-chair of Nonfiction Now, uh, along with Robin Hemley. Uh, on behalf of RMIT University, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional owners of the land on which the university stands. RMIT University respectfully recognises elders, both past and present. As soon as we knew that we'd be bringing the Nonfiction Now conference to Melbourne this year and hosting it for the first time outside the United States, one of our first discussions was who should be the Australian keynote speaker? In this international conversation about nonfiction and its myriad forms spanning literature, journalism, film, and beyond, about nonfiction, how powerfully affecting and urgent it can be, but how complex and problematic, too in its negotiation of how we see and understand the world and how we change it in whatever small ways. Which Australian voice would we choose to help frame our discussions over the three days? The answer, we thought, was absolutely clear. Helen Garner. The only problem was she said no. <laughs> Helen Garner has been a critically acclaimed and best-selling author for 35 years since her autobiographical novel, Monkey Grip, was published in 1977. She's won more awards than you can poke a stick at. Awards for her non-fiction, journalism, fiction and screenwriting. The National Book Council Award, the South Australian Premier's Award, the New South Wales Premier's Literary Award twice, the Walkley Award, Ned Kelly Award, the Melbourne Prize for Literature, the Victorian Premier's Literary Award, the Queensland Premier's Literary Award, the Barbara Jeffress Award. I'm sure there's actually quite a few more. Helen has written feature journalism, essays, articles, and film reviews throughout her career. Her major non-fiction works, The First Stone and Joe Cinque's Consolation, are both highly personal investigations into events where complex ethical and political questions collide. The First Stone tells the story of an indecent assault case brought by students at an elite university residential college against the master of that college because of events which took place at a college party. Helen digs into this story about sex and power and her own complex reaction to it as a veteran feminist who feels sympathetic to but also critical of some of the actions of the young women involved. Cue huge controversy upon publication of book. In Jo Chinque's Consolation, Helen tries to understand the troubling implications of a trial that took place in Canberra in the 1990s in which a young woman was convicted of manslaughter for killing her boyfriend with a lethal dose of heroin a course of action the young woman had announced to various friends in advance. Helen Garner wanders in where angels fear to tread, quietly but doggedly, notebook in tow. Her forensic powers of observation, especially blunt self-observation, are obvious to anyone who reads her. The powerful, simple, powerfully simple beauty of Helen Garner's writing has been universally praised. But she's also got into a lot of trouble for her writing. Famously, she was fired from what might have been her last sensible job as a high school teacher after, as Wikipedia tells it, publishing in The Digger, a counterculture magazine, an anonymous account of frank and extended discussions she had with her students about sexuality and sexual advances. When she's written fiction, some have complained that it was really non-fiction, her diaries with the names changed. And when she's written non-fiction, some people have said she invented too much. For all of these reasons, we wanted Helen. <laughs> because she's not afraid to ask difficult questions, most of all of herself. Because she's a boundary crosser, a transgressor, a troublemaker. Because, let's face it, she writes so beautifully. And because she spent a lifetime engaged in the hard daily slog of transposing the world she observes and feels and thinks about into writing. She did say no at first. She said that she had no grand, original, striding thoughts to lay down with a crash. She said she couldn't be a standard barrier for anything. For all of these reasons, we wanted Helen. <laughs> and we're very pleased that after not too long at all, and with great grace, she said yes. And she's come to share with us a few quiet thoughts and insights. So please welcome Helen Garner.
Thank you. I'd like to correct David on one point. I've hardly won any prizes for non-fiction. I won't talk about that anymore, and I'm not whinging about it, I'm just pointing it out. I'm, I'm quite glad I accepted the invitation now. I'm having a really nice time at this conference. I, I'd like to thank David Shields for his very liberating permission to quote. But I'm 70 now, and I still feel bad if I don't attribute my quotes. And also, I'm going to have to quote myself a bit, so I hope that'll be OK. Seven years ago, in September 2005, a man called Robert Farquharson from the small Victorian town of Winchelsea was driving his three little boys home to their mother, his ex-wife, after a Father's Day outing. A few kilometres from her house, his car veered off the road and plunged into a deep dam. He escaped, but all his children drowned. He was charged with murder. Since his committal hearing in 2006, I've been following his path through the courts. In 2007, he was found guilty on three counts of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. He appealed. In 2009, his conviction was overturned and a new trial ordered. In 2010, he was tried again. Once more, a jury found him guilty. In 2012, this past April, he appealed for a second time. The Victorian Court of Appeal has not yet handed down its decision and nobody knows when it will. Patience has never been my strong suit. Some people have wondered why I couldn't just sit down like Truman Capote and write the story without waiting for the final outcome. I was stupid enough to try this. I tried for almost a year. It was like dragging great shaggy ropes of seaweed out of my guts. When it got too painful, when I could hardly get out of bed in the morning to try again, I stopped. I had 70,000 words. They were useless. My sister told me they were boring. Of course, of course I was furious and mortally offended, but she was right. The point of view of the work was wrong, the tone of voice was wrong, the structure was wrong, the whole damn thing was wrong, wrong, wrong. It was misbegotten, it was a disaster. Certain people have advised me to write something else while I'm waiting. Surely I have some other book I can dash off in the meantime. I, I found this suggestion even more mystifying and isolating than another question that a surprisingly large number of people have asked me. Why are you interested in this story? Loneliness, of course, is the natural condition of the writer. After 40 years of it, I've learned to tolerate and even to enjoy the miserable introversion that seems to be part of the deal. <laughs> But what's less easy to put up with, though, is the feeling before I start a new book that I have no accumulated competence, that what I learnt while writing my earlier books won't travel with me across the gap, that I have to start again from scratch every single time. Thus, I was relieved to read in the Australian Book Review an essay by the writer and former homicide detective, Dean Byron. He said, to write with full confidence in one's own ability and purpose is to submit to a hubris antithetical to the exploratory nature of the process. I've become very interested over the past 15 years or so in homicide detectives. I mean real ones that I come across in my work. I'm acquainted with two of them. They appear from time to time in my dreams. When this first happened, I was very embarrassed I thought, oh God, how trashy, a grandmother pushing 70 who dreams about detectives. <laughs> but, but when I gave the matter some slightly less literal-minded thought, it occurred to me that the detective in my dream is enacting the searching, doggedly curious part of me, the non-fiction writer part, the working part with which the dreaming part needs to establish a harmonious and fruitful relationship. Patience is a quality rarely modelled or praised in our hysterically fast-moving world. <clears throat> but I'm struck by the quietness of detectives, their ability to pay attention and to wait. 
When I'm in court watching a long trial, no matter how deeply engaged I am in the proceedings, I find it very hard to sit still. I'm always blowing my nose or rummaging for a different pen or polishing my glasses on the hem of my T-shirt. As Jeff Dyer tartly remarks in his long essay on the London Olympics, we even have trouble concentrating on things by which we are wholly absorbed. But during the Farquharson trials, I noticed that the informant, that is the detective in charge of the investigation, would sit in the timber pew behind the bar table, completely motionless, hour after hour, alert and calm in his dark suit, his eyelids never drooping, his spine upright, his shoulders relaxed. Outside the court one morning, I said to him, how come you can sit so still in there? I never even see you moving. He looked at me with his pale eyes for a moment, then replied, I've worked on this for five years. I'm just really interested. <laughs> the, pa <laughs> the patience of a detective is as complex and as endless as the patience that's demanded of a writer. I've been reading the French novelist Michel Houellebecq, whom I had too hastily dismissed as a grimly depressive misogynist. He is that, but he's a lot of other things as well. <laughs> he published a book last year called The Map and the Territory. Late in the story, he introduces an ageing detective called Jasselin, who's wandering round near the scene of a horrible murder. The dead man is, in fact, a character called Welbeck, but since all this happens in a novel, we won't let that distract us. Randomly, as he drifts about near the crime scene, Jasselin copies into his notebook the license plate of a parked car. Now, this is the quote. In the course of an investigation, as he always said to his students, it is fundamental to take notes. You should never let a day of an investigation pass without taking at least one note, he insisted, even if the fact noted seemed to be totally lacking in importance. The rest of the investigation would almost always confirm this lack of importance, but this wasn't the essential point. The essential point was to remain active, to maintain a minimum intellectual activity. For a completely inactive policeman becomes discouraged and therefore becomes incapable of reacting when important facts do start to manifest themselves. Curiously, Jasselin was thus unknowingly formulating recommendations almost identical to those that Welbeck had given on the subject of his work as a writer the one time he'd agreed to teach a creative writing workshop. This reminded me of what a detective told me he'd been taught in training. The investigation is never over, not before the trial, not during the trial, not even after the trial has ended. Welbeck goes on to talk about the torture of writing, or rather of non-writing. He's talking about novels, but even we literal-minded non-fiction writers recognise with a shudder the ghastly, unavoidable, unbearable state he describes. And this is a quote from him. You can always take notes and try to string together sentences, but to launch yourself into the writing of a novel, you have to wait for all that to become compact and irrefutable. You have to wait for the appearance of an authentic core of necessity. You never decide to write a novel. A book was like a block of concrete that had decided to set and the author's freedom to act was limited to the fact of being there and of waiting in frightening inactivity for the process to start by itself. In this state of frightening inactivity, I have a thousand things to say, but I lack a form in which to hold them. I can't force them into a shape. If I try, it damages them and it damages me. Force is destructive. Until I make a form, or rather sense one arising spontaneously from the material as I helplessly brood over it, the things I want to say aren't even things. They're only ripples of consciousness, what Joan Didion once called bits of the mind's string too short to use. I have to respect them and collect them without knowing what they are. I have to go out of the house and walk around the world porous. I have to wait and wait and wait, no matter how wretched and guilty waiting makes me. 
If I try to force the unborn thing into some clever shape that my bossy intellect thrusts at me, I'll deafen and blind myself to what's going on around me. Busy hauling those seaweed ropes out of my guts, I'll miss the moment when the wind changes and when it suddenly and inexplicably becomes right for me to behave as the poet Richard Wilbur suggests. As a queen sits down, knowing that a chair will be there, or a general raises his hand and is given the field glasses, step off assuredly into the blank of your mind. Something will come to you. I found over the years that the, the heart of the non-fiction enterprise, at least the sort that I engage in, is the interview. People commonly discuss the ethics of interviewing. In fact, they become rather obsessed with the ethics of it. This month, I taught with Michael Gawenda, who's a former journalist and, and editor of The Age newspaper. We taught a two-day non-fiction workshop at Melbourne University's Centre for Advanced Journalism. Gawenda and I are both in our 60s. Well, OK, I'm not going to address stress this point. <laughs> raised, <laughs> raised in a more swashbuckling and loose-textured time. We were taken aback to see how frightened many of the younger participants were by the prospect of interviewing. They fretted over getting permission in advance, over whose permission would be required, what legal documents they must sign or ask their subjects to sign, what promises or undertakings they would have to make to entitle them to rock up to someone, even a member of their own family, with a tape recorder or a notebook and start asking questions. Their anxiety expressed itself over and over in these terms. Who does the story belong to and do I have the right to tell it? I'm sure this is something that will be bracingly thrashed out in the course of this conference. If anyone comes up with a final answer, I hope I'll be there to hear it. But the way I look at it is the story does not exist as a story until a writer makes it. A story is not an object that's been dropped on the ground. You don't stroll past and see it lying there, pick it up, dust it off, and put your name on it. What you stumble on is a mess of fragments. It's your task as a writer, indeed it's your duty, your sole function in the universe, to do the labour of shaping inchoate matter into something with a meaningful, pain-relieving and aesthetically pleasing form. Further anxiety in our short writing course clustered around the matter of using notes and taped material. To what extent were writers permitted to change or clarify what their subjects had said? Were they obliged to use direct quotes? What if their subjects felt betrayed or misquoted? In other words, the ethics and the aesthetics of interviewing were tangled up together. In her useful and enthralling book, The Journalist and the Murderer, Janet Malcolm, the American writer, tackles this matter with an inspired common sense. This is what she says about it. As everyone who has studied transcripts of tape-recorded speech knows, we all seem to be extremely reluctant to come right out and say what we mean. Thus, the bizarre syntax, the hesitations, the circumlocutions, the repetitions, the contradictions, the lacunae in almost every non-sentence we speak. When a journalist undertakes to quote a subject he is interviewed on tape, he owes it to the subject, no less than to the reader, to translate his speech into prose. Only the most uncharitable or inept journalist will hold a subject to his literal utterances and fail to perform the sort of editing and rewriting that in life our ear automatically and instantaneously performs. There is an atmosphere of truthfulness present when it's the writer's own ear that has caught the drift of the subject's thought. I think Janet Malcolm um, wrote this section of the book after she'd been uh, sued by somebody who claimed that she had invented quotes it's actually quite a wonderful story. She, um, it was a book called In the Freud Archives, 
and a man called Geoffrey Masson, whom she'd interviewed, uh, was furious with her about what she'd written and sued her. And she um, was unable to prove to the court satisfaction uh, that she had not fabricated quotes. So she lost the case. But some time after this, her, she had a little grandchild who was just a little crawling toddler. And the child came to her house and was crawling along the bottom shelf of the bookshelf in her office and pulled out, the child pulled out of the shelf a red covered notebook and when Janet Malcolm picked it up to look at what it was, it turned out to be the notes, the missing notes from the interviews that she'd done with Geoffrey Masson. So this enabled her to um, go back and uh, reopen the whole matter and I think it ended to, in her favour and I really hope it did. Besides the aesthetics and the aesthetics, there's also something we might call the erotics of interviewing, particularly when you're interviewing someone who's gone through a trauma. By erotics, I don't mean simple sexual attraction, though we're all familiar with the famous guy who winds up having a career-smashing, marriage-wrecking affair with the, his female biographer. I'm thinking more about the charge of mysterious psychic energy that can flash between a subject and an interviewer, what the Jungians call the spark that, an, that ignites and connects. The mother of a murder victim, for example, is a figure of colossal power, especially if she's Italian. She exudes an almost visible vapour of anguish. In the presence of Maria Cinque, Jo Cinque's mother, I had no idea at first, how to comport myself. I didn't understand what was happening to me in her company. On my first visit to her house, for the nine gruelling hours I spent with her and her husband Nino at the kitchen table, armed with my ridiculous boom box, I felt small and weak, ignorant, shallow, unjustly blessed by my uneventful life. I struggled to assert myself against what I experienced that day as a huge negative force of their rage. And when I listened to the tape afterwards, I died my own small death of shame. The grandeur or the squalor of another person's suffering seeks out your limits and reveals them to you in a blazing light. It shows you your own smallness. It challenges you to open yourself to enlarge your imagination to a point where you can encompass what you're being shown, where you can make a place inside yourself to hold that suffering and to contemplate it with the humility and the reverence that it demands. This hurts, but it's also an honour and a precious opportunity. Those terrifying blasts of rage and grief, moments of numb bewilderment and sudden tenderness and tears. These can call up in you an answering complexity, an awkward, timid compassion that might break you out of your solitary prison and even transform your whole relationship with the world. In such encounters, you have to learn to be silent. So when you think about it like this, the beginner's fear of interviewing turns out to be not just legalistic timidity and procrastination, it's more a kind of instinctive respect. Now, before I came in to start giving this talk, I was sitting out there at the table and it occurred to me that I've only given one side of that intimacy. I thought I should have spoken about boundaries, I should have spoken about how writers often don't have any, and writers go into interview situations naked. I mean, you need to go in, not exactly naked, but perhaps very undefended with your defences down. And into you floods this tremendous tidal wave of agony. If you sit there and bear it, and if later you come back for more and you develop a relationship with the person that you've been interviewing, that intimacy in itself can be 
a very difficult thing to manage. It's not exactly, it's not friendship, it's something else. But because we don't seem to have language for it, people try to deal with it by means of the sort of social manoeuvres that we know um, are useful in friendship. I have found that a difficult thing to deal with. I don't know how you can withdraw from that kind of shocking intimacy. I do, this is a rather trivial um, memory, but I do remember when I was researching that book called The First Stone, the one about the um, sexual harassment um, story at Ormond College, I, I, a strange thing kept happening. It, it didn't just happen once. And, and these weren't interviews of, of intense intimacy. They would, they were, I, I, I would interview a person who had something to do with the college or um, knew something about it. And we would sit for hours talking and I'd take notes and I'd tape the thing and then I'd go home and I'd transcribe the tape and I would have promised the person that I would show them the uh, transcript of what they would said before I put it in the book. I don't do that for everybody, by the way, but um, people who I think aren't going to make trouble, I would do, <laughs> do for them. But I, I noticed a strange thing that, um, so what would happen, would I'd, I'd send them the, um, the transcript, and then they'd ring me up and say, um, uh, yeah, everything's okay, there's just a few little factual errors, can we meet in such and such a cafe and I'll point them out to you. So I'd rock up to the cafe at the appointed moment and I'd look around and I'd think, oh, there's no one here that I know. And so I'd sit down at a table and 10 minutes would pass and then, then I'd look around again and I'd see there'd be a person at the back waving to me who'd been there all along, Helen. And I'd say, who is this? And then I would realise that it was the person I'd come to meet, that, I'd, that in my mind they had, I had transformed their appearance so completely that I didn't even recognise them. And this would have happened to me half a dozen times over the period I was researching that book. It was terribly embarrassing because often the people would have, um, as I said, they weren't interviews of the intimacy that I've described with Maria Cinque and her family, but they were people that had laid out their experiences for me. They'd been friendly and kind to me and open to me. And I'd gone away and I'd given the bloke a beard or um, made the woman be wearing a, a sort of Larry jacket. And then when I saw her again, I'd say, oh, she would never have worn a houndstooth jacket. How could I have thought this? Or I'd change people's hairdos or put more makeup on them. And, and um, I puzzle over this. I, I don't know if that's an example of some sort of boundaries that spontaneously developed. It's a pretty crude boundary when you don't even recognise them next time you see them. But um, it, it did puzzle me, and I wondered if it was uh, partly to do with what a character is in a book. Even if it's a non-fiction book, uh, there is a certain character-making um, process that occurs quite spontaneously, I think, so this has been a puzzle to me. I, I, I managed to um, get wriggle out of it by you know, saying I, I didn't have my glasses on or some pathetic excuse of that sort. Nobody seemed to be particularly offended. But it did unnerve me, really threw me. But thinking of the, the sort of emotional violence that can take place in an interview, it's not really surprising that beginners are afraid of, of launching on it. But there's a simple exchange that, that I love in, uh, between two characters in a Hilary Mantel novel, an early one of hers, called Flood. And this is the exchange. Are you afraid? Yes. Good. Nothing is achieved without proper fear. Proper fear is good. It's a mistake to approach an interview knowing what you want to find out and going after it by means of a tight little list of questions, or even worse, with a template derived from an overarching idea. There's a glaring example of this in Michael Apted's famous British documentary series, Seven Up. You'll remember the three working class schoolgirls sitting on a couch, talking cheerfully about how they imagine their futures. We're touched by their endearing confidence. In the following episode though, one of them announces that she has got married at 19 in the intervening years. And, she says, looking straight into the camera with an interestingly pugnacious expression, I ask myself, 
what have I done? The invisible interviewer makes no response to her rhetorical question. He goes on asking the three of them about employment opportunities. The young woman tries again. I ask myself, she repeats it <laughs> at a slightly higher volume, what have I done? Still, he fails to register what she said. Once more, she presses it. What have I done? Incredibly, the interviewer ignores this rich material that she's holding out to him. It's not that he brushes her aside. He hasn't even heard her because he's deaf to everything that doesn't immediately fit into his overriding template, which in that series was class. She realises that he's never going to respond. Her face goes blank and she sits back. Every interviewer, every journalist and non-fiction writer and documentary maker has a personal cache of missed chances. One of mine occurred seven years ago during an interview I did with David McAllister, the artistic director, director of the Australian Ballet. In the context, I know nothing about ballet, in the context of the heavy duty interviewing I've been speaking about tonight, it's not a very important missed chance, but it's a good example of interviewer's deafness, I think, and for some reason it haunts me. I was asking him what it was like to dance on stage and this is a quote from the article. He said, it's going to that deep place within you where you don't notice anyone else and you can be in the moment. It doesn't always happen, but when you get there, it's the most extraordinary feeling. Then the curtain comes down and you say to yourself, I have no idea what I just did. I have no memory of it. I found I could experience things on stage that I couldn't in real life. Emotional things, I said, Yes, he said, incredible anger. Or you can really fall in love. You work with a partner day in and day out, and on he went talking. And it wasn't until I read the published interview, I'd actually written it up and published it, that I tripped over the phrase incredible anger. I stared at it in astonishment. How could I have let that get past me? I still don't know why it drives me crazy that I didn't pick up on it. Some days I even think I'll go back down to Ballet HQ and knock on his door and say, look, this is a bit late, but what did you mean when you, talk, <laughs> when you talked about incredible anger? And when I dug out the magazine yesterday and looked up that ballet interview, I was surprised to find in my introduction to it a description of a classic struggle. Here's the quote. I went to the company's headquarters intending to ask David McAllister about the part the mind plays in dance. There was something hopeless about this enterprise. We sat for an hour or so in his glass-walled office with the tape recorder between us, struggling doggedly to steer the conversation towards what each of us imagined was the cerebral, but it kept skidding away into something lighter and more fun, a kind of merry chattering, a comparing of notes about life, punctuated by bursts of laughter, growling sounds, self-mimicry, gasps, and periodic long pauses where the grinding of mental gears was almost audible. So there it is, my rigid template, and the antics the subject will throw himself into to avoid being squashed by the interviewer into a narrow place where he can't breathe. About 43 years ago, when my daughter was a baby, I got it into my head that I wanted to learn to ice skate. I used to... That is funny. <laughs> you don't know how funny. I, I used to take the tram down to St Moritz by myself on the odd afternoon when I was free. I'd lace on a pair of those ugly, lumpy-toed black skates that you could hire down there and hobble out onto the rink. I didn't have a clue how to do it. I staggered about, bent over with both hands stuck out in front of me, Countless times I fell. I didn't care because nobody I knew was there. I never got much good at it and I gave it up after I fell flat on my belly and winded myself so badly that I had to crawl off the ice. One day though, before I lost heart, I arrived and found the rink almost empty. I was slumping along in my usual cowardly way, clinging to the rail, when a man in a dark blue RAAF ice hockey wind cheater stepped past me and onto the ice. He must have been a gun skater, but on this day he was just gliding quietly round the rink as if to amuse himself while he waited for a friend. 
Something made me lurch out onto the ice and follow him. He didn't notice me behind him. He didn't pick up speed. He simply skated along, left, right, left, looking straight ahead with his hands serenely folded like this in the small of his back, like a drawing in a children's book, you know, with a little scarf flying. I tuned myself to his rhythm and began to copy his movements. I mimicked the slight forward angle of his torso and the way he swayed his shoulders. I saw that instead of slithering lightly and feebly across the frozen surface, as I did, he dug in with his blades. Years later, I would recognise this as what's called in music a tack. But that day, as I copied him, I started to get a grip. For the first time, I was moving like a skater. If any writer showed me how to skate, it's Janet Malcolm. In the early 90s, while I was trying to write my first book-length piece of non-fiction, I chanced to pick up The Silent Woman, Malcolm's study of the biographers of Sylvia Plath. I was already familiar with earlier books of hers and was, as I still am, very much in sympathy with what she calls the psychoanalytic view of reality, with, quote, its basic doctrine that life is lived on two levels of thought and act, one in our awareness and the other only inferable from dreams, slips of the tongue and inexplicable behaviour, unquote. What I learnt from Malcolm was the gall to dig my blades into the ice. I learnt from watching and copying her that I could go much further than simply describing people's inexplicable behaviour. I saw that I could get a grip and start to interpret it, to coax meaning from it. The tools were already in my possession without my knowing. It dawned on me with a dizzy sense of power that in non-fiction as well as in novels, <clears throat> I could call on the imagery, the spontaneous associations, and the emblematic objects that I had learned to trust when I was in psychoanalytic psychotherapy. And further, that I could draw richly on the close reading of poetry that I had been taught at university in the early 60s. I can't give chapter and verse of what Janet Malcolm has taught me. I know that some readers find her mean-spirited. Joyce Carol Oates, for example, in the Times Literary Supplement, tore her most recent book to bits. She spoke about Malcolm's cold, cruel, raptor's eye. I can only say that whenever I open one of her books, I feel an affinity on a level I rarely reach with other writers. The tone of her voice fills me with intense curiosity and delight. I don't really understand how influence works. It's beyond me to unpick her densely rhetorical pages. But I know that if I hadn't spent hours lying groaning on a shrink's couch, if I hadn't read The Silent Woman, that book that proceeds from a bone-deep respect for psychoanalytic thinking, I would not have had the nerve, or rather it wouldn't have occurred to me, to draw from my second visit to the Chinkway's house the insights that offered themselves to me there. And here's another quote from Joe Chinque's Consolation. While Maria prepared the coffee and set out cakes, she launched in her low, rapid, husky voice on a great tale about their next door neighbours, very nice people, whose rainwater tank, however, had a habit of overflowing and flooding the Chinque's side yard and whom Nino could not persuade to split the cost of a wall. She went on at such enormous length and in such detail about these neighbours and about another one, a woman who came into their garden without asking and took from their tree large quantities of figs before they were ripe, that I realised she was working to keep at bay the painful subject that I had presumably come to discuss, the murder of her son. But the spontaneous images of her talk an unstoppable flood, the theft of unripe fruit, seem poetic in their aptness. Nor without the silent woman would I have had the cheek to interpret a small unconscious gesture made by an old retired judge and former chair of the Ormond College Council whom I interviewed for my book, The First Stone. He was a fierce old Presbyterian in highly polished brogues who lived with his wife out in Canterbury and used brisk military expressions like no names, no pack drill. I still don't know what that means. but <laughs> I mean, I get the point, but... People told me that in the days when he ran the college council meetings, 
He would blatantly not notice women members who raised their hands to speak. I felt pretty sure I wouldn't get him to tell me anything about the background to the sexual harassment scandal. As an experienced lawyer, he would skillfully block my amateurish questions. And so it came to pass. And here's the quote. A cuckoo popped out of a clock and called the hour. It's 11 o'clock, said Mr R, standing up. I'll put the kettle on. He soon returned, carrying a tray of plunger coffee and a jar of homemade shortbread biscuits. He took a biscuit for himself and put the jar on a small table beside me. I ate one. It was excellent, the absolutely perfect biscuit. I remarked on this and took another, then perhaps another. <laughs> ten, ten minutes later, without breaking off what he was saying, he got up from his chair, walked over to my table, and replaced the lid on the biscuit jar. <laughs> he was halfway back to his seat when he suddenly stopped, turned towards me and said, I didn't do that to keep you out of there. We both laughed, but I thought, yes, you did, sir. You, you were putting the lid back on what you know. I won't get any more out of you. And I didn't. But as he was ushering me to the door, he showed me a chink in his armour, a moment of vulnerability that makes me remember this prickly old misogynist with a reluctant warmth. Here's the quote. He stopped in the sunny hallway and pointed to a small watercolour on the wall, a picture by Harold Herbert of a flat desert town in North Africa, rows of white houses, a strip of blue sea on the horizon, and in the upper corner, a plane streaking away. This is my prized possession at the moment, he said. He thought it was a town he had been in during the war. He mentioned Rommel. We got the Italians out of it, he said. It's a beautiful picture, I said. It's more than beautiful, said Mr R severely. It's accurate. I resisted an impulse to dawdle, to ask him, do you often think of the war now you're old? Does it seem very close to you? Was it the best time of your life? It occurred to me later that his desire to mention the war to me was similar to my urge to tell the hostile, crusading young feminists I'd been clashing with that I had worked in the abortion law reform movement in the 60s. I wanted to tell them, listen, we helped to change the abortion laws. There was such pathos in it. It was a way of saying, I may look weak to you now, but once I too was young and strong. It's frustrating to me that I've had to talk tonight so much about the past, instead of being free, legally and morally, to speak about the unfinished book about the court case that's paralysing me. It's in my mind all the time. Like the detective in Michael and Michelle Welbeck's novel, I make notes about it every day. Everything I read or hear seems to be connected to it. I'm always drifting past the Supreme Court. I love the Supreme Court. I wander in and out of the building, looking wistfully in at other trials. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm like a faithful, melancholy little ghost. Sometimes, of course, I long to be released. A few weeks ago, I arrived at my rented office on a Monday morning, put my key in the lock and opened my door. There was mess in there. I thought, someone's broken in and smashed up the joint. Then I had a proper look and I saw that the ceiling had fallen in. It, it, this, there was a circle. This is an old building, a 19th century building. There's a circle of plaster right above my chair uh, where the, the, the chunks, great lumps of 19th century plaster had crashed onto my chair where if I hadn't been procrastinating and bludging at home, I would have been sitting and I would have been knocked out cold or worse. And you should have, you should have seen the face on the uh, building manager. When he said, Helen, my God, that's all I could say. The next morning anyway, I woke up feeling inexplicably lighthearted. I knew why. It was a message. The, the, the ceiling was a message. Dear Helen, you don't have to write this goddamn book. <laughs> Signed, the universe. <laughs> but now, while the insurance company and the building management toil their way towards hiring someone to repair the ceiling, maybe sometime early next year, they say, I've had to move all my documents and trial transcripts out of the office and stash them in crates inside my actual house where I live where my grandchildren have to squeeze past them on their way to my computer to watch dinosaur videos and party rock anthem on YouTube. 
I don't want my grandchildren to ask me what's in the crates. I'm afraid that the fate of the three little boys who drowned in the dam that Father's Day might leak out and contaminate them. And I may fantasise release, but in my heart I know that somehow it's become my job to get narrative command of those fragmented events. Somebody, for some reason it seems to be me, has to shape their chaos and mystery and horror into that sanity-saving thing that human beings call a story so that we can contemplate it usefully and bring to bear on it what small comfort that philosophy or religion or psychology might have to offer. Thank you very much, Helen. And Helen has um, graciously um, uh, agreed to take some, a few quick questions. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. So if anybody does have a question, um, we have a lot of people here, so I'd ask you to keep it really brief and to the point um, so that we can um, get questions from a few people if there are any. Just put up your hand if you want to ask a question. We'll get a microphone to you. Helen, I, I remember in uh, The Silent Woman um, that uh, Janet Malcolm talks about Alwyn Hughes. And Alwyn Hughes, yes, yes Ted Hughes' uh, that, sister. That's right, and, and the story of her uh, not really finding out what she was trying to find out revealed another story, and yes. like uh, the, the, who the silent woman really was, this fierce visage that, that Olwen Hughes was so confronted by. Hmm. And so, so my question is, do you find that in your uh, groping for the, or the research for stories that you find uh, that sometimes the story turns into another story? Hmm. It may not turn completely into another story, but there's a lot of... Uh, you're going along what you think of, the high, uh, of as the highway of the story. You think, I'm going towards X, whatever you imagine might be down there. And, uh, and these byways present themselves, and they're often extremely interesting. And um, people have got bees in their bonnets. You know, when, and if you, that's another problem with uh, perhaps not being quite as um, formal as one might with an interview, is that you get talking, and then you, then you have a drink, and then it's five o'clock, and they you know, bring out the wine, and then, and then they say, well, why don't you stay for dinner? And then when you stay for dinner, then they say, let me tell you about X. And suddenly this great story. And you think, wow, this is fantastic. And you rush home and you think, this has got nothing to do with my book. And you just have to let it go. But um, no, it's never happened to me that a story completely took a turn like that or that the bottom dropped out of it. But I, I, I wouldn't put it past any story to do that. <laughs> The apple on the cover of Joe Cinque's Consolation. Whose idea, and was it because of the girl going out to buy apples before he was killed? It, well, actually, apples appear three times in that book. Um, there were some apples for, oh, I think the first apples that appear were when I was looking at the crime scene photos of the house. Uh, the flat that Joe Chinque and his girlfriend lived in, and there was a bowl of very shiny green um, Granny Smith apples in the kitchen, and they, there was a lot of chaos and crap lying around in the kitchen. You know, there was a student house. But there were these beautiful apples, and, and I just mentally noticed them. And then... Uh, then the, the, uh, the, other, the second girl who was accused of, of murdering him said that she'd been sent out to buy some apples because Joe wanted some apples after he'd been... They, he was drugged over two or three days, you need to know. They, his girlfriend was giving him rohypnol every time. He'd have a cup, a cup of coffee, darling, and there was rohypnol in it. So he was totally zonked out for several days. And, and when he came to, he asked for some apples. And then the third appearance of apples in the book is when I 
it's right near the end of the book where when I'm up in Newcastle and I and his mother uh, put me onto his previous girlfriend who his mother hoped that he would marry but that it hadn't worked out that way and I phoned her up and we talked for a long time lovely girl the next day she called me back and she said there's one thing I forgot to mention about Joe he really he loved apples and he also thought that if you ate a lot of apples, you would always be healthy. And I thought, oh, the poor guy, you know, he must have woken up feeling so stupefied and stunned and not knowing what was the matter with him. And I thought, well, I'll eat an apple. Maybe that'll help. So that's why there's an apple on the cover. Any more questions? Oh, this one here. Oh. Helen, do you revisit these stories, these, um, these, inc these cases, do you revisit them and do you follow up what's happened to the people who've ended up in jail or do you have an ongoing interest that never stops? Yes, but it's not, it's not that kind of driven interest that you feel when you're actually researching the story. And I will, life would be unbearable if that, if that sort of degree of interest. But... Oh, gossip reaches me. Um, and people say, oh, guess what? I, I saw um, so-and-so doing this or that, or did you know that she got a criminology degree? Or um, Yes, I do. I, things reach me, but I don't search them out. Except that I've remained in contact with the Chinkways. I mean, I would consider them to be friends of mine now. But, uh, no, I, 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 in a sense, it's sort of... It's a bit of a relief to get away from the intensity of it. That's partly what the book's about. If you could just move it a bit away from yourself by technical means. Helen, how did you get started with monkey grip? <laughs> <laughs> well, back then, when that book came out, uh, one of the first um, review, reviews of the book said, huh, this isn't a novel, she's only published a diary. And I thought, that's outrageous. But of course it was the truth, you know, that's what I did. I used to, I used to keep a diary, I've been re I've still, I still keep a diary and I have done since I was a teenager, but I burnt it up to the, about the year 1980 because it was so boring. Also I'd covered, I'd covered that in monkey grip. But, but um, I don't, I just thought I could see, um, you know, we, we're talking a lot about the sh shapes of stories at this conference, how, how You've got all this sort of inchoate material and then one day you just see a little tiny thread and you think, oh, maybe I could follow that and see where it goes. And so I just took the diaries down to the State Library and, and I copied them out laboriously by hand, the interesting bits, and I cut out the boring bits. I, mean, I think I probably left a few boring bits in, but, but and then I wrote a few little bridging passages and, uh, and then I took it to a publisher and uh, I just... Those were the days, you know, hardly... <laughs> they were going, please give us a book, you know, we need a book to publish, whereas it's the opposite now. Yeah, but I, I'm, sure that, I'm sure that book would never have been published if there wasn't a women's publishing company, because I did show it to one bloke I know who worked for, for a big publishing firm, and he said, nah, hell no, nah, it's too emotional. I thought... <laughs> <laughs> so and I, then I took it round to McPhee Gribble, and, and uh, they really liked it, so, yeah, I was happy about that. But that's how it happened. I just, um, I just kind of segued from diary into novel or whatever you want to call it. I have no. to ask a question. Yeah. Okay, well, let's please put your hands together. One more time for Helen Bauer.